Yes, and, yes, please start. It's working, great. Um, so I wanna talk about virtual events. I've been doing a lot of virtual events in the last two years uh, because of the pandemic and, and uh, my group, uh, Access Computing, has been sort of helping with that, uh, with different organizations and so on. So I have a little bit of knowledge about what makes a virtual event accessible. Um, so I represent, uh, I'm at the University of Washington, uh, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Washington, and I represent Access Computing, which is a National Science Foundation funded running participation and computing um, uh, program. And I'm the principal investigator, Cheryl Burke Stollard, Raja Kushalagar, uh, Elaine Short, Stacey Bronham, and Amy Coe are my co-PIs uh, from different institutions around the United States. And we've been doing this since uh, 2006 under a series of, of different grants. And I thought I'd just give a sort of an overview of access computing and um, distinguish it from other things that, that are going on. So our goal is simply to <clears throat> increase the participation and success of people with disabilities in computing fields. And this has been the goal from the very beginning. And of course, you know, participation nowadays means participating in, in you know, in remote meetings and virtual meetings and, and so on. And here are three pictures of actually students I've worked with over, over the years with different uh, kinds of disabilities. Um, and access computing has uh, two sort of main thrusts. One is direct intervention with students. And we've worked with really about 1,200 students now over the years uh, around the United States primarily uh, because it is a National Science Foundation. Uh, and we provide mentoring and career development activities that we fund students to go to conferences. Uh, we have webinars ourselves uh, talking about things like disclosure and so on. And, and so we've been very successful at that. A number of our students uh, have gone on uh, and gotten PhDs and some are professors at various institutions around the United States. Uh, we're also into institutional, oh, by the way, there's a picture on the right there of some kids I worked with at the National Federation of the Blind uh, several years ago. That, I love that picture. <laughs> and then uh, we also, uh, institutional change, and that's kind of why I'm here today. Uh, we have 70 partners, mostly uh, about 55 academic partners and a bunch of other partners, including some industry partners. And uh, we work with them. They all have the same goal that Access Computing does, and we work with them to help them in their institutions uh, do better. Uh, we're a primary advocate for accessibility and inclusion of people with disabilities in our field. Uh, we do some training helping people uh, do better. Um, we're also working on accessible, not accessible cur curricula about accessibility. Uh, this is a project with uh, me and Amy Coe, and hopefully in the next two years we'll have a, an ebook that will have uh, lots of lessons about how you can include disability and accessibility in your in your courses in computer science, information science, and so on. And uh, we're considered a national resource, so people come to us all the time, just like like you did. Um, so, so what is disability? Well, it, it's it's really a spectrum um, from being completely able to being unable in some respect. It could be a physical or mental difference. It could relate to seeing, hearing, walking, mobility, dexterity, memory, concentration, social. So you can think of autism uh, in terms of social. So it, it's huge, it's a huge space. And uh, of course we try to navigate, navigate all of it. Um, the World Health Organization estimates there are 1 billion people worldwide who have a disability. And my guess is there's actually more. Uh, I've seen numbers as high as 250 million uh, people who are uh, blind or visually impaired, and a similar number for deaf and hard of hearing. But you can imagine now, you know, people are, are becoming disabled overnight uh, in, in, the, in Ukraine, you know, because war has a lot to do with disability. And on the on the bottom right, I have a little, little picture. Uh, in the in, in the um, x direction is age, and in the y direction is ability from unable to able. 
And pretty much everybody is on this curve, a curve like this, that you start out. Now, some people are born with a disability, so they're, they're, their height of ability will not be as high. But everybody starts that we can't walk when we start. Well, we can't speak. Uh, you know, we can barely understand our, our, our environment as a child, as a baby. And then we become more and more able as we learn and get better. And then we hopefully stay that way most of our lives. And then toward the end of our lives, we begin to lose our hearing, our seeing, maybe our memory and so on. So that's a kind of typical world. So basically disability affects everyone. It's not something that is that you're not going to have. Most people have somebody they know uh, personally in their family or nearby, you know, relative or somebody down the street who has a disability. So it's so it's a common thing. It's not a rare thing. And <clears throat> you know, I looked at this uh, SIG Access Accessibility Virtual Conference Guide, which I, I consider to be very, very good very well thought out. And, and part of that uh, guide has kind of the sort of spectrum of things about disability uh, that have to be considered uh, if you're going to have a virtual conference or you're going to deal with people who have disabilities. And so there's lots of different access technologies. Sometimes they're called assistive technologies, things like screen readers. So screen reader enables a blind person to look at, for example, a web page or an app and get speech output or braille output instead of visual output. And of course, it's not automatic that that system has to be built to be screen reader accessible in the first place. Uh, many people use magnification. I use it from time to time. Uh, uh, but Control Plus makes my, my browser magnify very quickly. Um, there's color issues, contrast issues. Um, some people can't use a mouse at all. I'm, I'm terrible with the mouse pad. I, I refuse to use it. I, I just, it makes me make tons of mistakes all the time. So I, I'm stuck with the old fashioned mouse. And um, so of course there are people that can't use the mouse at all. They don't have the physical ability to use a mouse. So, you know, does, does a web app or a, uh, a web page have the ability to navigate it with just the keyboard. Um, there's switch control, uh, or excuse me, before that, alternatives to a mouse. So, uh, you know, things like uh, 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 a mouth stick to touch a touch screen instead of using your finger, for example. That's an alternative to a mouse. So you can drag that stick across the screen and do a drag and drop, for example. And I know people that use that. There's something called switch control where uh, the items on your screen are scanned one after another at a certain rate. And when the thing you want to open uh, occurs, it gets highlighted, then you hit the switch and that gets chosen. So it's a very slow process of, of using a screen, but uh, some people it's, it's kind of required. They don't have the ability to do, you know, for example, use speech input. Uh, they don't have the ability to use the mouse or even the keyboard. Um, so switch control is the only thing they can do. And then uh, voice control. So voice control would be speech input. And this is, uh, you know, becoming more and more popular. The iOS operating system and the Mac operating system have voice control. So you can actually uh, do things completely with your voice. Of course, there's things like eye gaze and, and other, other methods of accessing uh, information on the screen, or I should say, navigating the screen is more what that has done, what that does. And then that's just you know physical kind of things. There's also communication diversity. So how do people receive information, uh, and and how do the people uh, uh, provide information? They might be deaf, for example, and are primary sign language users. They might need captions. Uh, they might be speech readers. You know, they might read lips. Um, there's things like audio description. If you have a video um, that uh, a blind person can't see, well, you, you can have the dialogue, but behind the dialogue are things that are happening and that can be audio described. There's also uh, something that's fairly rare is augmentative and alternative communication devices. So AAC, it's commonly called. So that's like a, a board uh, where you can uh, 
do different kinds of uh, selections and things like that to create sentences and so on. And there's a whole field of, of accessibility that deals with AAC, people that can't use speech, that can't use other things that they they, they have a sort of a touchscreen interface. And it's been around since for quite a few years and there's many different variations of it. There's also invisible inclusion needs. You know, for example, you know, if your virtual conference is you know, kind of complicated, it's not good for anybody really, and especially people who have difficulty with executive function, that they can't figure out how to do things. So having something very straightforward organization, I'm sure, Ed, you've worried about this uh, quite a bit, um, making sure that, that, um, that your application is very straightforward. Uh, distractions are minimized. You know, there aren't things flashing, there aren't things going on that you have to look at and be, and that can, you know, these distractions can really upset people who have um, ADHD, that they get distracted easily. Uh, flexibility of engagement. So some people, you know, like in a class, I'm not thinking of a virtual space, but a class where, where you have to raise your hand and ask a question. Well, some people will never do that because they're too shy or they have autism or some some issue. So maybe another way to ask questions in a class would be would be so sort of different ways to engage beyond just talking. Um, so these are kind of the disability space. So it's kind of big. So what is accessibility? So accessibility to an activity means that people who have a disability can participate in the activity as equitably as possible. And accessibility is achieved by two approaches, basically accommodations. And so those are like, in, you know, individual things. Uh, accommodations are provided on request typically, like sign language interpreters or wheelchair ramps and things like that, or universal design. Uh, uh, access is built in from the beginning, and I know uh, that you are trying to do that with this with this application. So things like captioning, screen reader, accessible websites, and and all the things that can be built in from the beginning, so that you don't have to have special accommodations for individuals. Um, there's also sort of an attitude toward. Well, that's a blurry picture. I wonder what, what happened there. I thought it was clear. Uh, attitudes toward accessibility. Um, uh, so if you think of accessibility as the common case, that it's not uncommon and then, and it, it's, you want to you don't want to just be reactive. You'd like to be proactive as much as possible. The ability is never perfect, but it, you move toward it. Accessibility is never perfect. You know, it's, it, there's nothing that works for everybody. So you want to sort of get better and then compliance is not enough, you know, I know there's a lot of concern about compliance. You want to do the right thing, but there's sort of like a welcoming attitude that is that is needed. So I think that's uh, kind of the, the attitude toward accessibility is kind of very important. How you think about disability. I just took a, a minor break. I have a little distraction behind me. Um, so what does accessibility mean in terms of conferences? So uh, there's physical disabilities, physical environment, like the hotel, the conference room, the lectern, different things that are sort of physical. Well, a virtual conference, you don't have to worry about that too much. Uh, the digital platform, the website, the virtual meeting, dynamic documents, things like that. Um, yeah, you have to worry about that. Uh, digital artifacts, proceedings, images, videos, um, these should be accessible as well. Presentations, the actual talks themselves um, and the panels, uh, are they accessible? Are the people who are giving the talks aware uh, that they should be uh, sort of doing things in an accessible way? Uh, for example, you know, are they talking, are they explaining what their images are? Like on this site, on this page, I have a image, sort of a logo that shows the different sort of dimensions of disability from wheelchair to uh, mental disability to sign, that's a sign, those hands are the symbol for sign language interpretation, and then somebody with a cane. Um, 
And then social interaction, uh, meeting people, having small group discussions. And I think these are the things that, that your group is very concerned about. Now, over the last two years, um, I've had a lot of experience with virtual conferences. Most of you have. Um, and what are they doing with regard to accessibility? So I looked at this uh, website called SageForce. I didn't put a link here. I should have. It lists 280 different virtual event platforms. And this is a group of uh, how many do I have there? Nine uh, platforms that I've actually used myself over the last two years and maybe before that as well. And one I just used this week or last week was the 6C conference, which was under Pathable. There's also Hopin. I went to a Hopin, several Hopin conferences, V Fairs, Gather, Blue Jeans. Uh, Zoom webinars, we've all done those. Whova, uh, WebEx, and finally Midspace at the end. And I have logos for eight of the nine, but I don't yet have the logo for Midspace because I couldn't find it. So I've put a nice uh, image on the far right there, uh, which is something that looks like a logo. Uh, it's kind of kind of cute. So that shows kind of the the, the, the plan for a Midspace kind of conference. So um, get yourselves a, a, a nice logo is my advice. So what did I learn from this? Well, first of all, hardly any of these people have on their front page anything about accessibility. So, and here I just have four that, uh, that I looked for anything about accessibility in, on their website. So Hopin says, ensuring that our web, website and products are equitable and accessible to all users is of high, highest priority. And the Hopin conference I went to did not really have a good way to, to do uh, real-time captions. If you gave a talk that had slides, you could use the captions provided by the slides, like PowerPoint or Google Slides, uh, to provide captions, but they couldn't do it themselves. So they have a nice wording there, but they, they didn't live up to it quite. Uh, gather, I went to a Gather conference or Gather, what do they call it? Gather Town, Gather Town. At Gather, we are committed to creating the best metaverse for all humanity. Wow, what a statement. We realize that, that to do this, we must design for all users, including those with disabilities, and who use assistive technology. And I will say that I went on this gather page, they said a lot of things on there, but they haven't done much, uh, in my view. I'll talk a little bit more about gather a little later. Uh, WebEx, we always build and continue continuously improve our collaboration solutions with accessibility, usability, and inclusivity. And I kind of kind of like this that they're they admit they're kind of in the process, you know, they're, they're, there's something that is a target and they're working on it. And, and WebEx is run by Cisco. So, you know, that they're, they're a major player. So they have to do things more accessibly. Uh, and then Midspace, oh, they have a great, a great web page. And at, at the very top accessibility is mentioned and a little bit down on the web page, it says accessibility is at the core of Midspace. And, and that's why I'm here because you guys are doing it. And, and I, I think it's really lovely. I've talked to both um, uh, Ed and uh, Benjamin earlier, uh, when was it? Last week, I guess, and, and learned more about what Midspace is doing and it's pretty terrific. So, uh, you know, things that I've seen over the last two years are screen reader accessible websites and apps that people are doing somewhat well on that, not perfect. Uh, you know, we hear back from our students who go to conferences about the websites and apps. And, and so um, I don't have anything specific, but there's almost always complaints. Uh, automated captions, many have that. Uh, captionist feed support. So you have a, a person who's doing the captionist who's going to give more accurate captions generally. The ability to pin a sign language interpreter. So some some things have it where if the person is talking, the person is highlighted. 
Well, a person who's deaf doesn't want that thing highlighted. They want the interpreter highlighted. Um, and so um, that's the ability to do that. And that's, for example, that's in Zoom, uh, Zoom meetings. Then there's accessibility guidelines. And I found three. Um, there's Section 508, revised Section 508 standards. That's the federal government accessibility standard from the United States. There's the EU standard EN301549. It's the accessibility requirements suitable for public procurement of ICT products and services in Europe. So there is actually this document uh, and there's a link to it there. And then the most famous one is WCAG, which is in version 2.1 um, or ISO IEC 40. 4500. So it's the WC3 WAI recently updated web content accessibility guidelines. And there, all of these things are highly detailed and, and have, um, you know, uh, what you should be doing. It doesn't necessarily describe how you should do it, but more what it should be in the end. And then there's the Voluntary Product Accessibility Template, or VPAT, which is commonly VPAT. And it's an accessibility checklist, basically. And uh, I don't know if Bidspace has one yet, but they probably should. Um, and I think most of the companies have them, but uh, they're typically out of date uh, because accessibility is something that, that requires constant improvement. And there's four versions. Uh, you can go to this web, uh, I have a link there that you can find these, these versions. Uh, they're basically templates that you, that you fill out. And for each item, it says what it's about, for example, color contrast for uh, having good color contrast or, or having good contrast is, I didn't mean color contrast, good contrast, black and white contrast is very important for many people uh, who have low vision. And you can ask, uh, you know, it's easy to check that on a web page. There's automatic checkers for color contrast and things like that. So do you support it? Uh, do you support it with exceptions? Do not support it, not applicable. Color contrast is always applicable. Um, or contrast is always applicable. Um, or not evaluated. But it's so easy to evaluate, you should be able to do that. So there's sort of five responses and you and you put down, for example, if you had support with exceptions, you'd say in another column on the same line what the exceptions are. So there is sort of a standard checklist process for checking accessibility. And you could try to do it internally, but you know, unless you're an accessibility expert, it, it might not, you might not get the right answers. So typically you would hire a third party consultant who has accessibility expertise to, to fill out your VPAT. And you should do it like every year because again, accessibility is hopefully improving. So that's something to think about. Now, this is kind of like, this is Gather Town. This is, this is not the meeting I went to, a Gather Town meeting, but I did go to one. And, you know, it tried to sort of imitate an in-person meeting, uh, but it really didn't. Um, you know, you have these different places you could go to, and you are one of these little guys. Uh, you find yourself, and then use the arrow keys to kind of move around uh, on the screen. And then if you run into somebody, you actually see them. They pop up on the screen just like that guy Ethan did right there. Or if you're if you go into a room, uh, there's uh, there's some people there. All the people pop up on, suddenly, and you can talk to them and and so on. So it's it's kind of cool but it's terribly inaccessible uh this is totally visually you know a visual kind of thing how do you navigate this thing uh without vision um so uh the people that did the gather town you know i i talked to them about it uh and you know what the problems were and they're definitely not using gather town again um so i said probably not you know, because a virtual conference is kind of different, you know, uh, it's not, you don't have to imitate a real life conference. And I went to one like V fairs and V fairs was trying to imitate a real conference and, and didn't do a very good job of it. So there are some advantages to just virtual meetings. Forget about trying to be a different, 
an in-person meeting. You know, that's a different animal. Just try to be a virtual meeting. So you have this opportunity for multiple channels of communication. You can have video chat, you can have messaging, you can have small meetings. You know, there's all sorts of ways to interact that you wouldn't necessarily have um, in person. You have to, you know, an in-person meeting, you, if you wanted to talk to somebody, you'd have to find them, you know, and, and so on. Uh, discovery, uh, you know, you, if you go to a virtual meeting, you have a list of attendees, you have a way to contact them, you have a way to have a random meeting, uh, meeting people in Hopin, that was kind of a cool feature where you could go into this room and then you just want to meet somebody individually, you just do it and you meet somebody randomly and it turned out the people I met were had a common interest with me and I don't know how they figured that out. I thought it would be AI, but I don't think it is. Um, so kind of things you can do that you couldn't do in a, in a, in a meeting. I mean, you could, there's no such thing as a random meeting. You have to kind of, there might be some serendipity uh, that you run into somebody, but that's not quite the same as, you know, meeting somebody that you're interested in meeting. Um, disability disclosure can be avoided. So if you have a disability, like a physical disability, or like you're in a wheelchair, you don't have to disclose that in a virtual meeting. You can just, just be, you know, yourself and, and not have to worry about, you know, people demeaning you or doing things that are kind of, uh, I would say, rude or something like that. And of course, everybody likes no travel. You know, you don't have to travel. And travel for people with some people with disabilities is actually quite difficult. Um, they might need an assistant to travel with them, for example. So uh, virtual meetings have a great advantage. And, and you're going to see more of them in these hybrid meetings. Uh, the, the 60 meeting I went to last week was a hybrid meeting. So about half the attendees were in person and about another half were remote. And it seemed to work out pretty well. You know, it was not perfect, but uh, definitely it was a great try. There are some disadvantages to virtual meetings. Uh, we call it Zoom fatigue. We've all felt that, I'm sure. Um, there's distractions, um, you know, that here I'm at home and my wife had to get something from the room behind me. And so that distracted me momentarily. Um, it's easy to sort of uh, lose contact with your meeting uh, because there's so many things going on around you that are not part of the meeting. And then there's missed opportunities, chance meetings with people. Uh, I'm six foot five. I'm easy to find. So people <laughs> come up to me and uh, they know who I am and I don't know who they are. It's kind of kind of cool. Um, and then there's informal time with people that you can you know meet with people informally. But in some ways, I've done that. I meet somebody and I say, well, oh, I'd like to talk to you some more. So we set up a separate meeting off channel outside of the meeting and we can do that. I can do that on Zoom, for example, on my Zoom account. So um, there are disadvantages to and there's probably more that you guys have thought about. So I'm done, uh, questions and discussions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay.